Hi, Ben. Thanks for joining me, friend. It's good to be here. Uh, so this is definitely going to be a bit of a different conversation than usual, but I would love to start with the, the usual opener, which is just to ask you about your life story and background, and you can share anything you like at whatever length you like. Okay, sounds good. Um, I would say that for, for better or for worse, and, and despite my attempts to run from it, a lot of my life story is definitely defined in relation to Christianity. So I was raised a uh, very conservative evangelical Christian, um, theologically similar to Southern Baptist, but I wasn't actually Southern Baptist. Um, I grew up in that environment. Uh, I deconverted during undergrad college, and uh, it's been a bit of a journey since then. A, with a, a number of different stops. And so I've, I've found myself at various times and even currently um, adjacent to things like rationalism, uh, effective altruism, post-rationalism. Um, and I found a lot of community on Twitter in, in relation to those, uh, those communities. Um, and we, we share a lot of those circles, I think. And um, in terms of a, who else I am and, and what else my life story is. Uh, I currently live in, in Texas, I'm American. <laughs> um, and I have a computer science degree and I, I work on the computer science and technical things like that. I currently work for a software company remotely. Hmm. What was your deconversion process like and what, what prompted that? Yeah, um, I think that my, my deconversion process is probably something that would be fairly relatable to a lot of people that have gone through that kind of process. Um, it, from what I've seen and other people I've talked to, it seems like this, this process absolutely varies and it's very individual, but it's, it's something that is a pretty similar shared story for a lot of people. And so for me, it was uh, definitely a, a lifelong struggle with certain aspects of, of the faith of being a Christian. Um, even from, from a pretty young age and just trying to think through things logically and rationally and seeing certain things that didn't fit or didn't make sense. Um, and, and when you're in that, that religious environment, there's, there's explanations for all of those things. There's, there's ways of, of explaining things away and there's ways of rationalizing. And so you get explanations and you don't feel like you, you completely don't have answers, but those answers are just like not completely satisfying. Um, and, you know, there's, there's a bunch of different questions that, that sometimes are the, the catalyst for, for different people. Uh, for me, it was some of the things were like this uh, perceived disconnect between the, the God portrayed in the Old Testament and the, uh, the massacres and the violence that were, were condoned and, and ordered by this God versus the, the message that was taught by Jesus in the New Testament. And, um, I, I never felt fully satisfied with the reconciliation of those, despite talking to a lot of, of people with more theological knowledge than me and, and people who had been Christians their whole life. Um, that was definitely a, a, a difficult question that, that it was always hard to, to find. I was always looking for a better answer for that. And I never seemed to find a really good one. Um, and then there's, there's little things like uh, in the New Testament, Paul will, will make comments uh about women in the church or or things like that and um on the surface they're the very like straightforwardly misogynistic things that, that are in the bible and um and you can get a variety of explanation for those like i said you know there, there's an explanation for all these things you know if you talk to christians it's not like nobody's thought about this before it's not like nobody's wrestled with it um but again you know i just i didn't find those answers to be satisfactory most of the time uh, and, and you get sort of weaker answers like, well, that was just a, a product of, of his time. And it was, that wasn't the point of the Bible. It wasn't about bringing about societal change. The point was the message of the gospel, um, et cetera, et cetera. You also have things like slavery in the Bible and, and the lack of any explicit condemnation of slavery. And then you get, you know, these, these weird explanations from Christians about that uh, along similar lines sometimes, like, well, the purpose of, of Jesus' message wasn't to bring about societal change and overthrow slavery, so that wasn't, that wasn't the main point, or you get explanations about how slavery in, in the Bible or in biblical times during the, the first century AD was, was very different from slavery as we would perceive it in more modern times, um, 
and and again you know it's just there's that was just two examples but you know, you, you get little questions like that and these things kind of pile up and you you look for answers and you you ask the people who you perceive to be knowledgeable and and smart who, who should be able to answer those questions and when you ask them over and over again and you just can't ever seem to quite find a satisfactory answer the cognitive dissonance just kind of builds up um so like I said, I ended up actually deconverting uh, while I was in college at undergrad. I went to a, a Christian university, and this was actually a Baptist school. It's in Ohio. Um, I ended up there because at the time I was choosing a college, I, I I didn't have a lot of agency in the process, and that was that was as much on me as as it was on anyone else. I certainly don't blame anyone else for that situation, but. Um, I definitely ended up at the school that my parents pushed me towards. I, I probably could have ended up somewhere else and then there's probably alternate timelines or versions of me that did something different, but uh, that, that was where I ended up um, largely due to uh, my parents encouraging me in that direction. And so I went to a very conservative uh, Baptist school in Ohio and um, I found that to be kind of a a make or break environment for, for faith. And so, you know, everyone who ends up at that school is, is either really gung ho about being there and they're all in on the Christianity thing and they, they're fully bought into it. Um, or they are, they, they're not. And, and, you know, if you're not, then, uh, that becomes apparent pretty quick because you, you either have to play along and, and fake it or, uh, you, you rebel against it. And so, um, despite that being a, a very Christian environment, I think that, that that really pushed me towards the tipping point of being like, okay, you know, I either have to reconcile these things, I have to address this cognitive dissonance, I have to find a way to fully buy into Christianity and 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 be here and thrive in this environment, or, uh, you know, I have, to, I have to go the other direction. Um, and it wasn't even, I, I described that as if it was this, this mounting uh, pressure that you know, led to some kind of dramatic breaking point, but there really wasn't any dramatic single turning point. It was just, I think in my, I was definitely, I definitely would have hesitated to describe myself as a Christian in my second year at the school as a sophomore. And I think by some point in my junior year, I, I definitely would have, uh, if asked and, and being honest with someone I trusted, I would have said, no, I'm not a Christian at this point. Um, but it did feel like kind of a gradual process of, of fighting with that cognitive dissonance, being unable to, to find a good resolution for it, and then gradually being exposed to other, other ways of viewing the world and seeing that things from other perspectives made a lot of sense uh, in ways that Christianity never quite fit together for me. Uh, and so, yeah, by, by some point I, around, 21, I would say, uh, I would no longer have described myself as a Christian. Hmm. What was it like for you to be there, not considering yourself a Christian? Yeah, that was, uh, that was an interesting experience for <laughs> sure, because by the time I got there to that point, you know, I'm describing this, and that was in my junior year. I've been there three years. I was doing a four-year degree, and uh you know, what do you do at that point? Do you, you quit and like transfer to a different school or you quit the degree or you just kind of tough it out and finish it? And um, I ended up doing the latter. I, I, my entire senior year, it was definitely a rough period because I, I was at that point going through a lot of, of turbulent reactionary opposition to Christianity. Um, I don't think that I was I think that was a necessary part of the process and it wasn't like a, a really unhealthy thing. I wasn't like filled with rage or rebelliousness against Christianity, but I was, I was definitely cynical about it at that point and, um, and, and pretty burned out on, on the whole Christian thing. And, and there was nothing I could really do other than go through the motions with as much intellectual honesty as I could muster and uh, just work on finishing out the degree. But uh, like I said, it was a, it was a conservative Baptist school and there was a uh, chapel service mandatory for all students five days a week. Um, so I was spending like five hours a week sitting in, in the auditorium during chapel services. And uh, that was that was not fun. Um, I found that overall, like I, I was able to I was able to handle any individual circumstance that I found myself in in a way that I, I felt like I was being intellectually honest. And I had other friends that were going through similar things. I definitely knew other people that had deconverted during college and, and were in a similar situation. And I 
you know, would talk to people like that. Um, and, and it wasn't necessarily like this deep, dark secret that you're, you're at the school and you're not a Christian. I think there's plenty of other people who are like that, but it certainly wasn't something that you, you know, publicized or went around talking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And you mentioned that uh, rationalism and post-rationalism have sort of been part of your journey since that time. Can you tell me a little bit more about that arc? Yeah. So um, I, I had one friend who went through a similar deconversion process. He, he actually, I would say his overall process was fairly similar to mine. We're, we're pretty close. We've talked through all of this a lot and went through quite a bit of it together. He went through a very similar process to me, but on a, a timeline like six months to a year ahead of me, which was really interesting. Um, so I remember having conversations with him sitting in the cafeteria at the school uh, where I was, you know, getting close to, to the point of, of really abandoning Christianity, but I was still trying to buy into these rationalizations and explaining things. And he was patiently talking to me and, and talking from different perspectives and, and secular ways of seeing things. And I was trying to defend Christianity and, and uh, we would have these conversations going back and forth. And, and I'm sure we spent hours and hours and hours talking. Um, and that was definitely a, a big part of the process. And one of the things that he introduced me to was uh, the, the website lesswrong.com, which probably a lot of your uh, listeners are familiar with, or at least have heard of. Um, Less Wrong is an online community. It's basically a forum website. Uh, originally founded by Eliezer Bielkowski and is kind of the, the central hub for the, the capital R rationalism movement. Um, and so this friend and I definitely uh, were intrigued by that. I think that I went through an initial phase of rejecting Christianity and reaching the point where I, I decided my way of resolving this cognitive dissonance is that I don't believe this stuff anymore. It's not true. It's just not true. And then you go through this phase of rebelliousness against Christianity and and reacting against it and being being angry about it. I mean, there's there's anger. There's there's this feeling that you were lied to or, or deceived for most of your life. Um, whether that's that's was intentional or, or not, and probably wasn't. At least for me, most of the I would even say almost probably all of the, the Christians in my life were by and large good people and, and had good intentions. Um, but, but there's this anger that you, you feel like it turns out all of this stuff isn't true and you were told this all your life. And so um, I think that that's an attitude that is, is pretty well represented by what you would see on uh, like r slash atheism subreddit. Um, there's this reactionary, angry Reddit atheism phase. And I, um, I think that's a step in a lot of people's journeys. Um, it's it's really not a destination. You don't want to be stuck there for very long because it's it's not a fun place to be, and it's uh, it's not productive, and it's it's ungrounded because you're you're just defining yourself in opposition to something. You're 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 just completely defined by the fact that you are not a Christian, and uh, there, there's a lack of any positive grounding, and so my experience, and I think a lot of people have gone through a similar pipeline, was going into that phase after leaving Christianity and then searching for something else that, that provides more coherence that, that um, gives you that positive grounding that you're lacking when you are purely opposing something that you used to believe. And I found that in rationalism. It, it seemed like a, a coherent worldview. It, it is a coherent worldview, I would say, um, that makes sense of things from a material perspective gives you a way of looking at the world where things fit together. There is, there is coherence. There is not the cognitive dissonance that I wrestled with for years and years and years in Christianity. Um, I, I think it has its own flaws. It's not perfect, but um, it provided the grounding that I was looking for at that point. And another thing that I don't think I was aware of at that point but subconsciously, it also provided uh, a, a relatively strong ideology um, in a similar way that Christianity had, and that felt familiar, although I don't think I was cognizant of that at the time, but it provides a similar 
kind of, here's what's true. Here's how you tell what's true. Here is the way reality is. Here's how you decide what to believe and here's what to do about it. And that kind of complete package was recognizable to me and, and felt familiar and it felt natural to pick that up. And so after leaving Christianity, I, I ended up in there for a little while. Mm-hmm. And um, how about post-rationalism? Do you, you, you said, sorry, I ended up in there for a little while. So it, it sounds yeah. like you don't still identify as a rationalist or, or yeah, what is I, it like now? I don't know. I mean, so like that's, that first question is, is a toss of like, do I still identify as a rationalist? I, I think I would say yes. I, I um, I don't know. Someone who's who's really into that scene and, and looks at me and, and talks to me and hears where I'm coming from, um, probably. <laughs> Sorry, um, might look at me and and say, no, you're not a rationalist. You know, you have these irrational beliefs. Um, I don't see it so much as like. Uh, stopping points on a on a path where you get to one point and you're there and then you leave that point and go to a new one I see it more as like building blocks that that have made me who I am today different different things that were added gradually so I I have no ill will towards rationalism at all I I like rationalism I still like less wrong Um, I I wouldn't necessarily subscribe to it or, or identify my entire ideology as being a rationalist but um, I would definitely say I'm still a rationalist. Uh, at the same time, I would say I'm a post-rationalist. And um, that's, a, that's a slippery word that people argue about a lot and a lot of people don't like. Um, my definition that I've always kind of uh, used for that is, is people who were in rationalism at some point and didn't find everything they were looking for there. Um, Yes, different people, and they'll tell you different definitions for that word. So, you know, that's just mine. But um, I see myself as someone who who definitely spent some time in the, the rationalist sphere. And I felt like I didn't find everything that I was looking for there and ended up looking beyond that elsewhere. And um, I, in the... the the very literal semantic sense, I would say that makes me a post-rationalist, someone who who used to be a rationalist and is now post that. <laughs> mm-hmm. What are some of the things so far that you've found yourself looking for or finding that weren't encompassed by rationality? Yeah, um, that's a great question. And it's also kind of hard to pin down. Mm-hmm. Um, like I said, I think that something, whether it's good or bad, one aspect of rationalism as a, as a worldview or, or a way of seeing is that it is a relatively strong ideology. Like it makes strong claims about the way the world is, the way the universe is, and what you're supposed to do in, as a result of that. Um, and like I said, that's part of why it is an attractor point, I think, for people who who leave a different strong ideology. Um, and at the end of the day, it doesn't actually necessarily change that much about the outcomes you're pursuing and, and what you, you choose to do. Uh, at the end of the day, Christianity you know, is more or less summed up by you know, what would Jesus do in your decisions of day to day, how how to act, how to treat other people. Um, it's a cliche phrase, but it's it really is a pretty good summary of mm. of Christian morality. And uh, I think that in in most situations, people who uh, would subscribe to rationalism or effective altruism would not end up acting in a lot of ways that different from what would Jesus do? And, you know, treat people with kindness, seek to make the world a better place, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but your original question was, well, what is, what did it, what did I find to be missing in rationalism? Well, um, and in particular, what have you been looking for that you found outside of it? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I think that, 
I think that rationalism is, is aspirational in a very optimistic way um, in that it wants to believe that humans are, are, are computers, meet computers with brains running, running hardware and that hardware, that software is, is imperfect and it, it has flaws. You, you make irrational decisions and you can improve that and you can be more rational and be more like a perfect computer. And I don't know, maybe that's, maybe that's fundamentally true, but I think that it is, it's reductive and it is, um, it's easy to end up not acknowledging important aspects of what it means to be a human when you reduce human behavior to that kind of frame. Um, I, I think that religion is something that is a really ancient part of, of humanity. It's been around for a long time and, and there's evolutionary psychology explanations for that and whatever. And, and maybe you can argue that religion is, is not needed now or something, or we've superseded the need for that. But um, there's something in us that seeks this deeper purpose or seeks this meaning or seeks, whether you call it the supernatural or, or God or enlightenment or, or whatever, um, there's a deep urge, there's an unmet need there that in my experience, rationalism doesn't really address. Hmm. Part of how I'm interpreting what you're saying correct me if this is wrong, but it's something like you left Christianity and you found rationalism and then you left or sort of grew out of, you grew out of both of them, shall we say, you grew out of Christianity, you grew out of yeah. rationality and you found yourself still yearning for something like meaning or understanding or maybe something spiritual or some larger sense of who you are and what the world is. Is that right? Yes, I'd say that's right. That's fair. That's a good descriptor. Yeah, there's there's a, a very fundamental yearning for for something spiritual. Spirituality is just it's it's hard coded into the the fiber of, of who we are, of of what a human is. And uh, when you take a, a purely materialistic and and secular worldview like rationalism and, and treat everything as a deterministic cause and effect. Uh, machinery and, and treat humans as, as meat computers, uh, you, you deny that. And I'm not sure necessarily that there is something supernatural, whatever you call that. I mean, we can get more into that if you want to, but um, I think there's ways of, of accessing spirituality and meeting those needs still within a, a materialistic worldview, but it's harder to do that within the prescribed capital R rationalism worldview that you would find prevalent on less wrong. Hmm. Hmm. What does it look like for you to follow these desires to make sense of your life and connect to something bigger? Yeah, I'm trying to figure that out. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, same. <laughs> I think yeah. we all are. Yes. Um, I think that, like you said, I spent time in Christianity, I spent time in, in rationalism, I spent time adjacent to effective altruism and, and those types of communities. And, and like you said, I feel like I sort of grew out of each of them in that I, I didn't find everything I was looking for in any one of them. Um, and I think that that's probably a lifelong process that, that you, you find things, you, you take what is good, you take what is useful, you integrate it and, and you grow. I mean, if you, if you end up stagnant in one place for too long, then that, that might be reflective of a lack of growing. Um, and I would say even like, I see that in a, a lot of the lifelong conservative Christian people that I know, I, I see a stagnation in their lives, even spiritually. Um, and you know, I don't begrudge them that if they're, if they're happy and in, in where they're at and they're the spirituality and the religion that they found is working well for them and, and they're thriving, then, you know, that's great. But 
Um, I, I definitely have seen and known a lot of people who have not significantly grown spiritually in, in decades of, of life and have just kind of spent a lot of time sitting in one place. Uh, and I, I think the thing I've found through years of, of wandering or whatever you want to call it is that that's not really for me. I, I perceive myself spending my entire life seeking and, and exploring and, and trying to figure out more. <laughs> I, I find it hard to to feel satisfied or, or to find any single prepackaged source of meaning. Um, with that said, I definitely do still find myself uh, circling back to places I've been before and, and finding that there is, is deeper meaning that wasn't accessible to me previously. Um, for example, Christianity, I, I I'm not at all hostile towards Christianity. And in fact, uh, I may or may not be some variety of heretical Christian currently. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, <laughs> mm -hmm. But there's there's a lot of good in Christianity. Um, and there's there's a lot to learn there. It, it's it's certainly not something that I see as fully wrong or problematic or or in need of being thrown out. Mm. Yeah, let's let's talk more about that. I I think um, I collected a couple of tweets from your account, and like um, I re I really like your account a lot, as I've told you before. And like, there's uh, I'm I'm it's occurring to me now. I think that like broadly, what I see happening on your account is like there's like sort of like status updates and you're like here's what I'm doing or what I'm working on and then you're, there's like a lot of really funny jokes like very funny jokes uh and then, <laughs> uh and then I don't know it, it seems like at least recently I've started noticing what I might call sort of like wisdom posts where you're sharing uh wisdom uh, from your perspective and uh I'd like to ask more about that and um one of the tweets I pulled out was from March of this year you said I've been much more able to hear and understand God since I left Christianity. Uh, can you mm. talk more about what that what that means? Sure. The Christianity that I grew up in is something that does not serve me anymore. Um, I don't see myself. I could be wrong, but I don't see myself ever wholly returning to something that would be recognizable as the, the same religion that I grew up with. Uh, like I said, you know, for a variety of reasons, um, a lot of it boiling down to just like very hardline uh, insistence on literal interpretation of, of the Bible. Um, there's just stuff that doesn't add up. It, it doesn't work as a worldview. It, there's incoherencies. There's um, it's just a lot of cognitive dissonance and and brain noise. And I have found that since I walked away from that Christianity, I have spent a lot less time wrestling with cognitive dissonance and spent a lot less time trying to untangle theological questions and spend a lot less time digging around and trying to understand semantic explanations of, of original languages and things and, oh, well, this actually meant X, Y, Z. Um, and when I was in that Christianity, I found myself muddled in all of that stuff a lot, um, trying, to, trying to untangle things that, that didn't have any satisfactory untanglement. And since walking away from that, I have definitely significantly increased my openness towards, well, pretty much everything. And um, I think that my, my ability to commune with God and to hear God has greatly increased since I have stopped looking down at this, these texts and these theological disputes and those kinds of questions and just being open. What is that? 
that you're finding or what would it, as you're open to the world? I'm finding that I believe in God. However, that's a very vague statement and I'm not terribly fond of the word God anyways, because it is so slippery and so it's used in so many different ways to describe so many different things that it's it's impossible to use it without um, adding a lot of qualifiers and explanation of what exactly you're referring to. But something that I've I've been finding recently is that that's that's a feature, not a bug. Um, so the Christianity that I grew up in seeked to monopolize that word, monopolize the word God, and insist that it refers to something very specific. And I, I think that the ambiguity is actually a feature because you're not referring to something very specific. You're referring to a lot of disparate things and concepts and, and being able to collectively motion towards all of that with a, a simple three-letter word is useful, even if it's not precise. So I would say I believe in God. If you ask me to define exactly what that means and what God is, I can certainly try. Um, and my explanation will differ from other people's explanation. Um, but I feel quite comfortable and at peace with the statement that I believe in God. And, uh, and I think that a lot of people can agree with that, at least people who are fairly tolerant and high openness. Um, and, and that allows me to find common ground with more people. And mm -hmm. that in itself is, is useful. Hmm. What would you say you mean when you say you believe in God? <laughs> yeah, um, I'm gonna throw out my explanation for this with the caveat that uh, if you're listening to this uh, six months from now or a year from now, this could be completely different. Uh, no, no guarantee that there will be consistency or uh, mm -hmm. that this will be what I believe six months from now or a year from now or one or six from minutes now. from now or six minutes from now um i i tend to spend a lot of time in a frame of looking at the world through a systems theory lens in, in that everything is a deeply interconnected system and uh we have this these concepts of of identity and and selves and uh, and I, I I use the word I constantly, referring to to something. What what exactly am I referring to? Well, I, I think the the boundaries there are pretty fuzzy. Um, I promise this is going somewhere. I know the original question was about God. <laughs> oh, you're good. Um, we we talk about discrete entities, and and I just don't think that those boundaries hold up when you look close enough at them. Um, you and me, for example, right now, you know, we're, we're two humans. There's, there's a brain inside of each of us, and we are talking incredibly through a video call wirelessly. You know, that's a whole separate thing. But, like, fundamentally, you know, our, we have two brains here, and those brains are processing tons of information, and, and we're sending information between the brains, too. And what, what exactly is you and what is me? Uh, I think that's a little bit fuzzy because... If, if you is just what's the information that's being processed inside of your brain, then what happens when you and I have a conversation and we're producing information with the combination of two brains? You know, is, is that a, a different entity? Is that something separate? Um, all that to say that I loosely subscribe to something like panpsychism, where it, it seems to me that there's no way to define consciousness as a, a contained thing that is limited to specific entities that, that only happens inside of a, a human brain, um, but somehow ceases to exist at the boundaries of your neurons. Um, it seems to me the entire world is, is a collection of information processing systems that are constantly interacting with each other, giving inputs and outputs to other systems and, and fractal subsystems spiraling downward and spiraling upward. You know, the entire universe is, is this massive complex machine of, of planets and galaxies spinning and, and colliding. And, and I don't see why, if I think that I'm conscious and I think that other people are conscious, 
I don't see why I wouldn't also conclude that other configurations of information being processed are not also conscious in some other way. So I think animals are conscious. Do they have the exact same type of consciousness that a human has? No, not even two humans have the exact same type of consciousness. I don't know what it's like to be you. You don't know exactly what it's like to be me. You can't, that's, that's fundamentally unknowable. All you can know is what it's like to be you. You can only know your type of consciousness, but a city is conscious. A country is conscious. The planet as a whole is conscious on some level. And this is just a phenomenon that, that spirals fractally downward and upward in both directions. And at the highest possible level where you have the entire universe and all the cosmos as one massive, extremely complex information processing machine, there's some kind of consciousness that's, that's present at that level. I have no idea what it's like. Any, any more than a, you know, an ant can't possibly understand what it's like to be conscious as a human. I can't understand what it would be like to be conscious as the universe itself, but I think that it's conscious as well. And that's what I would say God is. Hmm. That's a good answer. I like that. Hmm. So one of the things I wanted to ask you about is this project that you're doing for a while of, uh, interviewing people and asking them about um yeah their worldviews and it seems like that's a that's a uh a theme that i'm hearing is like desiring coherence and uh like some sensible worldview that you can speak about and understand um what made you want to start the project to interview people and ask about their worldviews yeah i think that it was definitely initially driven by this longstanding desire to be able to find and embrace and rest in a coherent, solid worldview. I don't identify with that desire so much anymore. Like I said earlier, I see it more as, as it's just a lifelong process that I'm going to be figuring out. It's not like I'm going to find the right answer or the right worldview and, and slot myself in there and, and be content. Um, so I would say I'm no longer as concerned with searching and finding the right worldview. Uh, but this, this phenomenon that happens where all these humans out in the world have different ways of, of seeing the world and thinking about things, and they each have their own worldview. And even within a group that would share the same label for their worldview, there's endless diversity of the, of the different ways that people look at things. And that that phenomenon itself is just endlessly fascinating to me so just getting to sit down and talk to someone and and ask them questions to try to understand a little bit better how they see the world and what's going on inside their mind and and what is their frame and their way of seeing um there's pretty much nothing more interesting to me than that i got the sense just now of you as sort of like a worldview anthropologist <laughs> yeah yeah that's a good way of putting it if that was you know, and maybe that's something I should put more thought into, because if there was some way that I could turn that into a career and like my my job was just talking to people and and, and documenting and understanding their worldviews, like that sounds amazing. I would love to do that. Hmm. Um, but yeah, yeah, worldview anthropologist is is a great way of putting it. Um, I think that's a good descriptor for for how I see myself when I'm when I'm working on this type of thing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How do you typically structure those interviews and what what goes into your sort of sensibilities around that yeah so when i started this um i it started from a throwaway tweet like most things do mm -hmm. uh in which i i said something along the lines of wouldn't it be interesting if i made up a, a list of of simple questions and just like set up Zoom calls with random people and interview them about their worldview. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, oh, that's a good idea. I should actually do that. <laughs> so I did. Um, I wrote up a list of, uh, it's like about eight very, very, very broad questions, um, intentionally ambiguous so that they can be interpreted in different ways. And the subject can you know, take those questions in, in whatever seems, whatever direction seems most fitting for them. Um, and I, I set up a, a Calendly so people could schedule and then I just you know started inviting people to do it. Um, the original format I chose made it quite a bit of work to get the interviews published and that slowed me down initially. 
So I've only published two of these so far. I have another one that I'm I am currently sitting on that I need to finish up and get published. Um, but the, the, the general idea of the project is something that I definitely see myself pursuing in the future, even if the, the format changes a little bit from what it was originally. Mm -hmm. And can, can you say explicitly what, what the format was originally that was sort of- Oh, uh, sure. Yeah. So the original format, the, the, the first two that I've published, which are, are on my website, uh, benratke.com, um, was a, a written interview, it was just a transcript. So I would interview someone over a Zoom call and record the audio from it. And then I just ran the audio through a automatic transcription service. And then I was editing down the transcript because there's a lot of bloat and such. And so I, I took those, I did about an hour interview, got it transcribed and then published it as a written blog post that was just a, you know, a, a dialogue back and forth, a written dialogue. Um, I ended up, you know, trimming them down quite a bit and editing out a lot of the, the bloat of filler and the ums and ahs and such. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would just, you know, run that finished transcript past the, the subject to make sure they were okay with the way everything was being represented before publishing it. Mm -hmm. Did you find that in the actual conversations you had any sort of aesthetic sensibilities about how you wanted to ask questions as an interviewer? Hmm. What do you mean by aesthetic sensibilities in that, mm. that question? Um, like, what made for a good or beautiful conversation and how you showed up as an interviewer asking questions in order to like steer towards something that you thought was a beautiful conversation? Gotcha. Um, well, I mean, one thing I found was that I'm good at it. And I didn't, I hadn't done anything like that before. And so I did these first few interviews and I discovered like, oh, I'm actually pretty good at this. Um, and I think that what goes into that, that skill is uh, being good at listening for sure. Being able to perceive or pick up on what are interesting hooks or, or, or points of interest that can be explored further and expanded upon. And so, like I said, I started out with this list of, of very broad questions. And then every interview I did ended up going in, in quite different directions um, because I would start out by asking these questions and then pick up on, on something interesting about what the person was sharing. And then just being open to hearing what they want to share and figuring out how to tactfully ask probing questions that are sufficiently vague that they can take the question in whatever direction they want. Mm -hmm. um, and it seemed to me that, that was that's a lot of what goes into doing a good interview. Hmm. Yeah, I appreciate you answering that. I mean, I uh, obviously conduct a lot of interviews myself, so it's uh, just You've done more than me. <laughs> well, uh, you know, in some ways, this uh, is just conversation, right? And this happens to be a right. recorded conversation. So I think we're both conversationalists, regardless of how many, uh, right. you know. And that's, that's, it's a very human thing. You know, it's not like, oh, we yes. are the specific type of people who are conversationalists. Like, uh, yeah. Um, right. We're the odd type of human that record our conversations and do something with them. <laughs> uh, yeah. Um, yeah. So I, um, you know, part of the impetus for having this conversation was to, for me to interview you and kind of get a sense of your background and also this project. But also um, I found myself curious about what, this, these worldview interviews looked like and wanted to give you the chance to uh, interview me on the podcast. And of course, we'll, we'll just publish this and you don't have to do the transcript, but uh, sure. yeah, I want to do that and then um, sort of debrief afterwards and see what we uh, would like to talk about then. Sounds good. I would love to do that. All right. I'm going to start off with some, like I said, all of these questions are intentionally somewhat vague and, and very broad so that you can pick up on whatever seems most alive or most interesting to you in the question and, and kind of run with that and just, just tell me whatever Great. comes to mind. So to start out with, who and or what are you and mm. how did you get here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, I love that question so much. And or what are, what are you? I'll start with what are you? Yes. Uh, okay. This is a living being that is a human that uh, is alive at a certain time. Um, 
he was given the name Michael when he was born and uh, received the name Tashin uh, about four years ago now. And um, yeah, I think of myself at this point as a monk or quasi monk or pilgrim wandering person, uh, sort of on my own unique spiritual path uh, that involves wandering from place to place and living a pretty simple life and uh, dedicating my time and energy to being of service to others and also being supported by generosity. You know, so I don't have a, a traditional job. Um, I just work on different projects that I do and uh, the ones that both interest me and seem enjoyable and seem to be of benefit. That's sort of the sweet spot that I aim for. Um, things that are service projects, but are actually enjoyable and interesting for me. Um, and uh, yeah, I think that's that's how I think of myself, of who I am and what I am. Thanks. Yeah, that's a great answer. Um, I noticed when you started that, you were talking in third person and you were kind of also like looking down at your body and 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 describing things about yourself and about your name. And, and you were talking in the third person there, um, which almost suggests maybe like you don't fully identify with your body or you see yourself as something separate from it. Could, could you say more about that? Do, do you identify with your body or do you feel like you are a being or an entity that is separate from or, or has a body? Hmm. Yeah, that was a really interesting experience. I did switch from the third person to the first and- uh, You did, you switched partway through. Yeah. Uh, some of that might be circumstantial from having, I just published an essay that was you know, written in the third person. Um, and that was, but I think some of it more, I'd say it's less of whether I identify as a body or not and more, although there might be some of that, but more just an awareness of um, being a living being more than uh, a human in particular, or more than being this person in particular. Um, mm, yeah. I guess some of this comes to believing in reincarnation, I guess, where it's like, seems like this is the, this is sort of the vessel that I'm in for a time. So I guess that does come to yeah. some sense of not identifying with my body, but. Like yeah. you can you can conceive of being something other than what you are right now that seems true yes is that true yeah okay yeah. okay i have a feeling we're going to end up coming back to that because reincarnation is a, an interesting topic um yes. but my next question first is uh we use these words true and false a lot if you were asked what is true and false what do those mean how do you differentiate them how would you answer that hmm. This took a while to work out to realize this was a thing and I'm still learning how to live according to this, but this seems like the best uh, um, account that I found of what's true and what's false, which is, first off, it's not external. It's not, um, I know I, I take, I take, a lot of stock in what people say or what research is done and like various learnings. I mean, you know, there's a bunch of books in here. I like reading books. I like seeing what other people have said. Um, I don't there, I don't like discount them categorically or something, but at the end of the day, I think that for me, what is true is um, something like, uh, how to put this, like we're alive and the way that we live is either in more or less accordance with who we are and what the world is. And you can be sort of like in a state of friction or mm. uh, fighting the universe sort of thing where you're like, mm. the, your choices are not good for you. They're not good for other people. They're not good for the world. And like, if you do that, then that produces um, friction. It's like suffering for you, suffering for other people. And so um, to me, what's true is like anything that reduces friction, reduces suffering, where it's like, I am happy, I'm not hurting other people. And then that's like, that's not a binary thing. It's sort of like a spectrum. And so to the extent yeah. that I am 
suffering and causing other suffering in my life, then I'm not in accordance with what is true. And to the extent that I am free of that, I am in accordance with what is true. Mm. That's a good answer. Thank you. Appreciate you sharing that. Mm -hmm. uh, next question, while we're still kind of talking about very general ontology, what is the world or the universe? Uh, do you have any sense of, of how it got here? Why does it exist? If there's a, if there's a reason, what, what is this place in which we, we find ourselves? I really wish I knew that. Um, there's a lot of these questions that I really wish I knew. Um, I think, um, I, at some level, I feel completely incapable of answering that. And at other levels, it's like pretty straightforward. So it's like, wh why is there anything at all? I don't know. I wish I knew. Um, why, like, how does it work that there is something rather than nothing? I don't know. Um, what created it? Uh, don't know. What I can say is um, one of the things that seems true to me in the way that I just described and that it reduces suffering for me and uh, seems to be of benefit is to see it in a lens of we're here to learn, learn lessons and help others. It's like those two things seem to be pretty primary. It's like if I look at being alive, being a human, being a living being on this world, in this life, it's like if I look at it with a view of I'm here to learn, this is my education, this is the school <laughs> uh, that I was enrolled in, <laughs> then uh, things go well. It's like, okay, well, what's the lessons to learn? You know, what are the things that I need to learn from the experiences I find myself in? And what can I learn from what's difficult? What can I grow in? Um, that seems, um, you know, um, I like that's not, that's not true in the sense of like, oh, I have a mathematical or philosophical, logical proof of it. It's true in the sense of like, when I look at things that way, I suffer less and like grow and develop and flourish. And um, that sort of symmetry seems to be uh, somewhat basic to the universe for me at this point of like, yes, this is a learning experience, one, and two, from what we learn, from the, like this, the, the knowledge that we gain, the wisdom that we learn, the skills that we develop, like, can we use that to help other people? Can we be of service? That seems also quite fundamental of like, how can I roll up my sleeves and help with what's here? And um, that also seems pretty basic uh, to the universe of like, you know, learn for yourself and help others while you're here kind of thing. Seems, yeah. Seems good. Yeah. I really like that, that way of seeing, it. I've heard you say that before talking about lessons to learn and, and gifts to give. Yes. Um, I think that answer kind of overlaps with the next question I'm going to ask, but uh, while, while we're here in this world, whatever it is, we don't know why there's something rather than nothing, but what things should you do while you're here? And are there things you shouldn't do? Is there, is there such a thing as should, shouldn't, or is there an ought? You know, the way I think about this is that um, pretty much every major religion or spiritual tradition has some list of rules that you should and should not do. And there's a lot of convergence between them. There's also a lot of divergence where they're not the same. Yeah. But there is a lot of convergence. So to the extent that there is convergence, especially um, like sort of peer agreement between religious traditions, I think if you like do like a, a multifaceted Venn diagram of those rules, like right. and looked at the convergence, like whatever converges is like probably pretty good. Like don't kill people, don't steal, you know, yeah. don't um, lie. You know, uh, those are those are those are good things. Um, helping other people, uh, loving other people, forgiving other people, uh, those also seem good. And I think um, those, yeah, I think of those rules as basically training wheels where it's like, okay, there are sort of like um, basic rules that you should follow that are good to follow. And if you do, they will sort of approximate um, what I was talking about earlier of like, not suffering and instead flourishing, but that eventually you have to graduate from training wheels and sort of 
dance with the universe and um, you find yourself in complex situations that no single rule could you know fully describe i mean there's no um you know for for example as an example like um not lying like yes that seems good most religious traditions would agree with that that seems like sort of largely self-evident that that's not good i mean people will have exceptions and say like oh well what about this circumstance but like for example in this conversation it would seem unskillful to lie to you right so i'm not aware of having lied to you so far um however that doesn't really govern what should i say what would be good to say in this interview um it's incomplete and like there's no there's no rule book i was given before this conversation that's like here's how to talk to ben when you're having a conversation with ben on a saturday in july you know like there's no book i can read that says that so um you have to sort of like morally mature and um grow up as an adult and and realize that um the rules while you should still follow them like those rules are good the ones that are um common are there for a reason they are insufficient they're like necessary but not sufficient yeah okay so as you're following to the best of your ability these necessary but not sufficient guidelines or, or heuristics and and learning to dance i like that that phrasing that you used it learning to to dance with the universe and that may look different for everyone as you're as you're figuring that out um are there particular like end goals that are that are worth pursuing or, or outcomes that you're seeking and, and how should you go about pursuing those goals hmm. you know from this lens of um giving gifts it's almost like um the way i tend to see it is everyone is here to give a gift and their life is a kind of gift. And I go back and forth about whether it's actually possible to fail to give your gift. Some people talk about this differently. Like, could you fail your life's purpose, for example? Uh, mm -hmm. Some people would say that you could. I, I don't know. I'm maybe a little bit uh, more conservative about that and, and nicer to people. Like, I don't know if you actually could fail, but. Um, that I suspect I'll have a better answer to that in towards the end of my life. But but to that extent, it's like, OK, if you have this sort of purpose or gift, which I think is not. Um, I, importantly, I think it's like not predetermined. It's complex and emergent rather than like mm. destined or fated. Um, I think the goal is to discover that and give it and live it and find out who you are and how you can best live your life for you and the world. and. Um, that's a very idiosyncratic singular process because it's unique to each person but uh like discovering that and moving in that direction towards um fully expressing yourself fully developing in yourself fully being of service to other in the way that only you can that seems like uh the thing to do yeah yeah so you mentioned reincarnation earlier i'm curious to hear how if at all, if that ties into this frame of of learning lessons while you're here and and giving gifts, how does how does reincarnation fit in or synthesize with that? Yes. Uh, I mean, pretty straightforwardly, in that if there is reincarnation, and you know, it doesn't just one end after you die, but also didn't, you know, just begin when you were born. Then, like, I, it seems to me each life is a sort of chapter in a longer learning process where you have mm -hmm. a sort of finite period of time and there's certain lessons that are available to you to learn in that circumstance that you find yourself in and um you learn those lessons and then um you know move on to the next life where you can learn other lessons and that sort of fits with seeing the universe as this sort of cosmic learning project yeah cosmic learning project i love that yeah um hmm okay so kind of related to that what does what does the future look like for for either you individually or, or the world as a whole like is this leading somewhere is that that cosmic learning project heading towards some penultimate outcome or what is what's the the direction here um sort of on the cosmic scale 
Yeah, let's let's start there on the cosmic scale. Mm -hmm. What are, is this leading? Like, you know, for example, like within Christianity, you know, it's it's going towards this this kingdom of God that that's coming and the a new earth and and mm -hmm. things like that. Yes, I think that's an astute vision of um, beneficence and uh, love and uh, connection to. The divine i think that if the only thing i'd say is uh it doesn't seem to me to need to end of like oh there's this set final point of oh we have achieved it and now we have come there's not the necessarily a conclusion yes i think that um like I mean, if you just look at it, I remember, I remember I have this memory, like one of my formative memories, I remember sitting on the bus, maybe in the fifth grade, like going to school. And I remember just thinking about how sad it was that like the plan was that I'd been told was like, okay, you're going to finish elementary school and then you'll go to middle school and then you'll go to high school and then you'll go to college and then you'll be done with learning. And it's like, no, I, I don't want to be done. I remember thinking that. And um, in a way, I think of that actually as in connection to the third Bodhisattva vow, which is like Dharma gates without end vow to, to know them. And um, it's like, I think that as a learner, if you genuinely have that desire of learning, like you do not want it to end. You want to just keep growing, keep making, keep creating, keep developing. And I think that that also is, um, seems to me to be innate to the universe as well of like, desiring increased complexity, increased beneficence, wisdom, love. And so I would hope, I, I, I don't know this because I'm not God, I don't have like direct proof of it, but I, I would hope that where we're steering is both the sort of like love and connection and beneficence that you would see in something like a description of a kingdom of heaven and mm -hmm. um, increased complexity and nuance and like, that's a, I mean, that's, those are tricky axes to like work together. So that's, yeah. Um, but I, I think that would be a, it would make sense to me that we'd be aiming for something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what are, what are some of the influences that have, have led you to some of the ideas that you're talking about here and, and this kind of way of viewing the world? Are, are there things that have, have brought you to this point or kind of influenced the way you think about this or how you've developed your thought? Yes, um, I'd say that there's uh, sort of external influences and then there's internal influences um, and those are sort of in dialogue. So I'll speak first to the external ones and then speak about some of the internal ones, because those are actually some of the more persuasive ones to me are the internal ones, but but they're in they're sort of in dialogue with these various influences externally. But I mean, for starters, um, I've read uh, some some bit of the the Pali Theravada Buddhist canon. And in that it's um, it's like, yeah, there is reincarnation. Like it's just all over the place and um, stated very straightforwardly. And um, that's, that's, that view has been helpful to me. Um, I think that I sort of uh, connect that to other, other spiritual traditions that talk about um, an afterlife and heavens and hells. And it's like, I, I mean, um, from the way I see it is like Christianity has ordinarily presented as like, well, you're born and then you die and then you either go to heaven or hell. And that's a straw Christianity, I know. But like um, in a Buddhist frame, it's like, well, first off, you were there before you were born. And also there are many heavenly realms and many hell realms and other kinds of realms as well. And um, they don't last forever, importantly. Uh, mm -hmm and uh you move through them and um yeah that that's probably been a major influence in particular one of the books that really influenced me was um uh there's a book uh that profiles like sort of biographies of um the the great disciples of the buddha and that has a very specific theravadan buddhist cosmology that's sort of like all fit together in a way that made a lot of sense to me of like the way it talks about it there is like the universe has um this cyclic strike structure where like buddhas will recur there are buddhas plural um, which uh -huh. is a common view to buddhism and um there's a sort of like almost like fractal geometric structure of like 
the kinds of people that are around the Buddha. Um, okay. Of like there's like two top male disciples and two top female disciples and like monks and nuns. And then there's also the, like the foremost um, male lay disciple. And, you know, there's this kind that like is his assistant and this one that's like foremost in uh, this power and this and that. Um, and they all talk about like uh, being in previous lives and seeing um, the person that was in their role with the previous Buddha and being like, I vow to be that in a future life. And um, then they become it. And whoa, yeah, it's sort of this like very tidy Buddhist cosmology that's sort of like in my head at this point. And um, yeah, there's that. I think um, there's also other other influences. I think um, I'd mentioned the egg, like watching the egg, uh, the animated video of it, just like um, I think that it's like it's a it's like a ten minute video, as in a short story, and so it's like very simplistic. But it seemed very true to me on a like deeper level than like the sort of container of the story. Um, yeah. Uh, most recently, there's a book that I read called LSD and the Mind of the Universe, and I'm hoping to have the author on my podcast at some point. But it, um, this guy took like seventy very high doses of acid trips and okay. uh like developed this whole like very elaborate um cosmology from that and that's what the book talks about based on and his personal experiences that's correct yeah and that sounds um, fascinating it's it's an amazing book um it's an amazing book and uh it it sort of um yeah all three of those things are sort of like probably major major influences on me at this point and they, they all sort of like fit but have different yeah uh, things that have clicked for me um I'll, I'll mention as well that um just the sort of inner stuff of um so i i have never had an experience of having knowledge of past lives which some people who meditate will talk about um mm -hmm. i've never had that on the other hand the more that i view things in terms of reincarnation the more different things about my life and other people's lives make sense to me, where it's like it has it has basically has tremendous explanatory power for me of things that yeah. otherwise would be strike me as just arbitrary, which which is um, it's a valid explanation to say that things are arbitrary, but it's not a satisfying one. And yeah. um, this is sort of like clicks for me. So um, a simple example would be. Um, a very simple example would be when I was in the monastery, I, well, for one, I didn't know anybody that trained at a monastery. No one was pushing me to go to train at a monastery. It sort of came out of nowhere, this like desire to train at a monastery. Um, yeah. And then when I did join, I noticed that one, I had, like, it was still, it was still very hard for me, but I seemed to have an easier experience of it in a particular way than other people were like, I was just like, oh, this is okay. This makes sense. Like we're in a monastery and this is how it goes yeah. here. And other people seem to have a lot of friction with it and challenge with it. And um, to me, it's like, okay, well, if, if there is reincarnation, then it makes sense that I would have trained in a monastery in a previous life. And um, yeah. Um, uh, that I would just sort of like be coming home in a certain way. Yeah. Yeah. I, I find that relatable in the sense of just approaching life and the world with relatively high openness um, leads to just a greater general satisfaction with with the way you see things um, and, and just being open to ways of seeing that have explanatory power, even if they're not necessarily empirically verifiable. Mm -hmm. um, like for me choosing to see everything as uh as conscious as alive I, I see the the entire universe as you know different levels of consciousness existing in all kinds of different interconnected systems mm -hmm. i can't prove mm -hmm. any of that but you know <laughs> it sort of fits yeah, yeah it, it fits yeah. it makes sense of a lot of things it, it seems to have a lot of explanatory power and um and and i like it <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. all right um, I've got one more question here, um, which is just 
how how confidently do you hold your your current worldview and your current way of seeing things? Is this something that has been relatively stable and, and steady for a while? Do you find that you're kind of flipping back and forth on certain things? Do you first see that 10 years from now you might have a totally different worldview or, or does this seem like something you're pretty solid in? Hmm. Um, you know, I think I've seen for myself in my own mind and life, a lot of the kinds of things that we've talked about of, um, you know, really identifying with a particular worldview or being in it and then sort of growing out of it. And so at this point, it seems likely to me that I would develop this and or grow out of it or see it differently. And almost I'd be, I'd be very open to that. Um, I think that um, this way of seeing that I'm describing now is, I'm almost thinking of it as like <clears throat> a snapshot of like, oh, this is what Tashin believes in July of 2022. Yeah. And like, yeah. It, it seems likely that that would unfold and develop and um, it could even change radically, but it's sort of um, expedient for the circumstances that I am in now and mm -hmm. um, fits, if there's a fit between it and how I live my life that uh, is good. And um, I would not be surprised though, if certain features of what I described remained in whatever evolved. Um, it's hard to say in advance, but like, right. You know, seeing as life is something worth learning from and that there's like lessons to learn or um, wanting to be of service to others, those seem those seem pretty likely to stick around in some shape or form. Um, could change, I don't know, but uh, if I if I were to guess, I think that maybe the specifics or um, even large parts of it might change, but uh, some desire to learn and be of service seems pretty fundamental. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you for sharing all of that. I would just like to say I really, appreciate and and value your way of seeing the world. I find it very, very wholesome and very refreshing and invigorating to hear you talk about these things um, and and seeing the way that you look at life as a, as a learning journey and a way to give gifts to other people. Um, it, it gives me a lot of joy. And so mm. I, I really appreciate you sharing this with me. Mm. That's sweet. Uh, I like to hear that. And uh, yeah, it feels nice to share this with you. I think... Um, yeah, it's nice to take a snapshot and I appreciate you asking these questions. Um, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about or that comes to mind? Hmm. I don't know that I have anything specific that I want to dig deeper into. Um, I mean, I'm definitely open to talking more about pretty much anything that we've covered or mm -hmm. any other topic that's interesting to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing is coming to mind that seems like nice to talk about, which is, um, uh, I remembered earlier today, two, two um, books or series of books that had an influence on me that I think, basically, I think there's a sort of kinship between us in the way that we want to learn from others' worldviews and uh, see them. And like, I mean, for me, that's, that's a large part of why I do interviews is to really get a sense of who someone is and how they see the world and, um, wanting to see if there's something I can learn from how they see the world. And, yeah. um, I remembered that there were sort of like two things that really instilled that for me. And I, I'd love to tell you about them and see what you think about them. Um, the first was, the Platonic Dialogues. Um, I mean, I read a bunch of Plato in school, and it seemed to me that that was sort of intrinsic to what Plato was trying to do, was like show that people were very varied and had very different opinions and very different worldviews, and that you could sort of inspect them by asking questions, and um, that when you sort of... Uh, it, it also seemed... Um, well, one, like almost like geometric of like, I did a lot of math at the time too, of like Euclid or other pure math. And like, like there were sort of, there's like a propositional logical 
aspect to it of like oh like it, for example if you believe in reincarnation right then what follows from that and like what right. things are consequent like that's a more fundamental thing than like this other thing um but right. also they seemed sort of um fragile like you could notice because because people had such different worldviews it's like well uh what is true and um that was one thing and then um have you read the trial by kafka i have not tell me about it uh this is it okay if i spoil spoil it a little bit or no you might yeah, not want a spoiler yeah. no go go ahead go ahead fill me in I mean, in brief, in brief, without saying too much, you know, I sort of thought, oh, this is going to be like a political novel about, uh, you know, bureaucracy or something. And it's like, uh, uh, there's a level of that. But I think that it's much more about like a sort of um, dis-ease at noticing how many different worldviews there are and how they are not no one is totally satisfying or complete and they are oh, like interesting not even in dialogue with each other and um how do you how do you how do you reconcile that? that yeah <laughs> yeah um and that that was i remember i read it on the beaches of thailand and it was so beautiful and the water was gorgeous and it was so warm and i was just like there was just horror in my heart reading this book it was like oh like how do you how do you live <laughs> the world will uh, never make sense <laughs> yes yeah uh yeah so i'm curious if either of those things stir anything up for you mm. yeah yeah that makes me want to read that that sounds really interesting um one I thing that, that like brings, it. yeah I mean, it sounds like something i would like and i think you have generally a pretty good sense of things i would like um one thing that brings to mind is is this idea that this is something I've developed personally is I used to really stress about that um, difference of worldviews and things don't make sense and you have to find the right answer and this is in tension with this other thing and eventually I got to a point where I found that I could recognize that the tension is not necessarily a bad thing that needs to be resolved uh, because strength comes from tension. So like you think about like a suspension bridge, you know, and the bridge is held up by the fact that there is tension and that's that's how the bridge works and exists. And in the same way, like there are abstract ideas and concepts and, and thought patterns that are able to exist and build on the tension of things that don't completely fit together hmm. and so that tension is is something to to observe and explore and appreciate but it's not necessarily something to be seen as an obstacle or something that needs to be collapsed and so switching my approach in that way and and thinking in more of those terms was part of my general increase in just like openness to to different ways of seeing and different worldviews and um, I, I no longer feel nearly as compelled to force coherence or or resolve things that seem to be in tension with each other. Uh, the fact that there are things in tension with one another is, is just part of the mystery. Hmm. 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 Would an example of that, like, in your own life be something like, on the one hand, this desire to understand the universe and like connect to something larger and maybe even believe in god and then on the other hand like uh finding like elements of a materialist worldview or like rationalism or like an analytical uh, approach to be useful in practice or something like that absolutely absolutely yeah. and that's a that's a great example because like for a while that was a source of tension for me was like <laughs> well I'm, I'm a rationalist i, I believe in in a materialist way of, of seeing the world but i can't i i would you know forbid myself from exploring or seriously entertaining spiritualistic types of of thinking and and then i got to be more at peace with that and and you know i'm just kind of okay with both mm. i i am largely materialistic depending on how exactly you define that and, and what you mean i supernatural is is a bit of an oxymoron um but I, I'm still largely materialistic and largely rationalist in a lot of, of the way I, I think day to day. Um, 
but I'm also definitely spiritual and, and definitely open to spiritual ways of thinking and seeing. Hmm. Hmm. And, mm-hmm. and that tension doesn't bother me like it used to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are there any other examples of that sort of tension that come to mind? Hmm. I think there are there are other examples that that possibly are, are subsets of that that mm. bigger example, um, like within Christianity specifically. Even um, there's there's a tension between you know the Bible or the Scriptures claim X Y Z, and you know this is what Christianity should be or has to be. Um, which is what I grew up in a very dogmatic view of, of things versus uh, a looser way of, of looking at it and learning from what is, what is good and what is useful and what is beneficial in Christianity without necessarily having to dogmatically accept everything from a particular Christian tradition. Uh, that, that was something that I, I wouldn't have been able to do, you know, even four years ago, um, yeah, I saw very much Christianity as a whole package, as, as their religion, and it, the idea of being able to find useful, beneficial, good things in it, or to um, or to to learn from from the teachings of Jesus, or even to you know read the Bible and find value in it. Uh, I, I don't think that I would have been in a headspace where I was able to really do that, and um, now I find that I am able to do that. You know, I, I do read the Bible. I, I am friends with a number of people who are Christians of various types, and I find that I'm able to find a lot of common ground with all of them and and learn from different traditions. And and there's a tension there, but I I don't feel uncomfortable with that tension. Hmm. That's sort of making sense for me of um, your reaction as well to me sharing my worldview because. I'm imagining that like you can uh, sort of be intrigued by it or and learn something from it or and be inspired by it without like necessarily needing to like wholesale adopt, say reincarnation. You can be like, oh yeah, like lessons to learn or gifts, being of service to others, gifts to give, like that that could, right. I think that fits in a lot of worldviews, even if you don't happen to believe in reincarnation like I do. Right, right, exactly. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Huh. Hmm. Anything else you'd like to say or talk about? Hmm. Nothing in particular comes to mind. Sounds good. Well, thank you so much for this conversation, Ben. It's been really enjoyable and I uh, appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, thank you for taking the time to talk to me today. It was a pleasure. <laughs>